Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Mr. Diamonds, for your presentation. Did you receive a 30 million rand pension when you left? No, that is a light note. But what is your comment on reading about Mr. Malefa receiving a 30 million rand pension for 18 months' work? Just briefly, if you could answer that, thanks. Uh, would you like you'll, you, you'll just respond to, the, oh, to okay. the question. Would you just keep your response very court, very short, yeah, because I've got a very I, limited time. I do apologise, I'm long-winded. Uh, I, I got a pension after 27 years of somebody that resigned. The amount was not that amount. And I think even with the person currently managing my pension fund, which I took out of Eskom, it's not yet that amount. Thank you, and we know that uh, that is subject of uh, part of this inquiry. Now, part of what we, we are looking into is the whole repurposing of ESCOM governance, the whole issue related to state capture by political persons and, of course, um, the Gupta family amongst other family members. But going back to your time, were you aware of any allegations of corruption and what steps did you take at that stage? We know there was a lot of questions around the Chancellor House Hitachi deal. What steps did you take to address those concerns that were in the public domain and that Parliament also was aware of at that time? Sorry, before you respond, Mr. Mr. Damas, I just want to caution the members. Members, you have 10 minutes to engage with Mr. Damas. The responses, his responses and your questions will amount to 10 minutes only. Very briefly, and you're welcome to supplement your answers in writing as well. Yeah, if, you would, uh, if that is needed, uh, certainly we will do that. With all issues around allegations, like I said, there were many ways of which they would come into Eskom, the whistleblower program, Brian's block, all of that. Uh, we would have that investigated, even if it was executives. I never judged any allegation. Forensics did that, and we would investigate either internally or externally. Uh, the issue that you raised, particularly around Chancellor House, just to give you background, I said to you that we've improved the governance when the big build procurement happened. One of the things that we did was that we separated uh, the evaluation of tenders uh, through the ESCOM teams, but we also implemented an independent uh, assessment for the board and probity assessment for the board on tender matters. We as a team and the independent assessment picked up the Chancellor House issue at the time that was reported to the board very explicitly, clearly. Uh, actually, the outcome of the tender the first time around was that Itachi was not going to get the tenders. It was actually Alstom. The second time around, when we had to rerun the process, we again raised the issue with the board at the time, made them clear on it, checked the, the Chancellor's issue. And I think subsequently to that, as been reported, the public protector also looked at that specific procurement. So we've taken action on all of those issues. You referred to changes that took place when Minister Gigaba was appointed. And it seemed, and would it be correct to say that the level of political interference increased from that day on? And was that a, an issue relating to your relationship at ESCOM? That's the first part. And then secondly, the acting CEO that was appointed, Mr. Machila, soon after, within a month of his appointment, finalized the 43 million rand New Age deal. Were you involved in the New Age deal at all? And if so, or if not, what is your comment on him finalizing that within a month of him being appointed? To answer your first question, uh, the yeah, I mean, there was a lot, like I said, the, the communication seems, you know, many, many a meeting we attended, uh, you know, I think in one particular meeting, an official from the department accused me of lying, and I got very angry. And what I realized is that information was being fed that I or Paul had no knowledge of. And, and, so, this, and so it became difficult. That's why I left. Um, 
The, yes, we had an engagement with the New Age. It was absolutely public. Uh, we, we had newspapers, there were the breakfast shows. I always gave the team guidance to make sure it's consistently dealt with, with all other newspapers, not to treat anybody unfairly. Uh, but I told you about the steam generator thing. That very same engagement to ask to address the steam generator, I was also asked to, I think, have some thousands of copies of newspaper thing. Uh, which I also said, I will we'll deal with it. And the team did. I gave it to the team. Uh, and again, the, to use your, always clear, make sure you follow your governance and be consistent. No firm, and the team's result of that whole process was they sought the mandate, I think, if I recall correctly, to have newspaper contracts. The mandate was not wanted. They came back to me and said, this is not wanted. I, they said, what do we do? I said, please go back to the procurement committee and tell them you close the mandate because you're unsuccessful, and we left the matter there. Uh, I then read, like you have, uh, about the thing happening afterwards. Thank you. Part of our challenge is looking historically, but also what is happening presently, and I think you correctly say uh, some of the issues, it is a bit late, but it's better late than never. Just on the issue of the, the, the Kuburg generator replacement, is it a concern to you that it still has not been replaced at this stage as an energy expert? And does that present a threat to uh, South Africans living in the Western Cape? <laughs> That's a big question. Uh, uh, the Kubuk uh, team uh, is hugely experienced. I think we're very fortunate. Uh, just uh, I do, I do apologize, Chair. By the time I left Kubuk, uh, the Kubuk team invited me back one night. It was early in the morning, two o'clock in the morning. And they invited me to switch off the reactor. Uh, because by the time I left, it was the first time in Eskom's history that this power station ran from an outage to another outage. And they wanted to give me the honor to switch the reactor off, which they did, which was quite unique. So you have a very competent team at Kubuk. You have a very competent team to look after the steam generators at Kubuk. Uh, the Kubuk steam generators uh, should be replaced. The issues relating to the Unit 4 turbine and the Unit 3 boiler at Duva, that was, at your, that was during uh, February 2011. But we understand that the final tenders for the repair are only now being awarded. Surely that is also totally unacceptable, the time delay and the alleged 2 billion rand increase uh, in the Dong Fang bid. Do you have any comment on that, seen as that was on your watch at, at that stage? And now we are almost six years later, and there, there doesn't seem to be any finalization in that degree as well. Again, indicating high levels of, let's put it, uh, political involvement or certain families' involvement in that when it came to the consultants involved. Just to add, I mean, uh, Advocate Verona, when he spoke to me, uh, raised a whole list of issues with me. Uh, and I did say to him, you know, the new age, what happened after I left, I can't comment on it. The T-Systems things that happened after I left, I can't comment on that. The Duva boiler procurement that happened after, I can't comment on that. But I'll give you a view on what happened when I was there. Uh, the Tegeta co contracts, I can't comment on that. McKinsey or Trillion that I read in the newspapers, I cannot comment on that. Uh, impulse, and so I think there's so many of these things. That, uh, but you have the booklet, and, and, and let me go back to the steam generators. The Kubuk turbine failure that happened, I think 2011, uh, happened uh, after a maintenance activity, uh, and it also was because of the the same unit failed in just after I left Duvers Power Station Man in 2004. What we would do with a major event like that, firstly, we would make a public announcement, but internally to Eskom, the power station manager's role is to make sure he looks after the safety of people first, then the safety of the plant, so if there's a fire to contain that. We would then launch an investigation from Eskom, a technical, it will be a major event declared. You would then get the insurance company integrally involved because the air plant is assured. They would lead the investigation, the root cause. They will tell you when to start repairs and how to repair. In that case, we appointed the original equipment manufacturer. Normally, you would get, and I think it's for whatever company, would then be brought in to rebuild the turbine. 
In the case of the boiler procurement, uh, the boiler failure, I know the boiler failed. I don't know when it failed. I think it was either the last month I was there or the last day. What I do know is by the time I left Eskom, I had no root cause as to why the failure happened, nor can I comment on the procurement. So for me, what I read is quite unusual. Uh, the other point I made to you earlier is that Treasury at Eskom is hugely confident and would evaluate what is the best value for money in all Eskom procurement. Thank you, and uh, my time's almost finalized, but just your comment, firstly, briefly on the death threats that you received. Is there any reason why, have you speculated as to what would you, would, uh, why would you have received it? Was it information that you might disclose? Have you received any threats come into Parliament before us today? And then lastly, your, your comments, if any, on the financial statements of ESCOM at this stage. We know we've got three, They've got three billion rand irregular expenditure and the decrease in operating profits compared to how you would have liked to have seen the company operating. Thank you. Uh, I've never speculated on the death threats. Uh, the death threat, I mean, uh, I can like be uh, quite busy when you work. So uh, there's a matter that Eskom, so Eskom Security looked after me quite well. They, they, they really looked off. I don't know what happened with the police thing. Coming here, uh, I hope nothing happens, so I have not taken. So, so you, you haven't received any no, threats? Right? No, Thank you. no, no, no. Uh, and then uh, on the Eskom financial situation, uh, we, we, we had, this thing was all one equation, and this equation we've agreed with the whole of government as to how do you construct assets with a balance sheet that has got no equity in it, and it's still valued on assets that were historically valued. And we've had many debates of this in Parliament. And so the equation of what Eskom had to borrow, how, what Eskom had to do as its own savings, uh, the responsibility, uh, and then this guarantee support framework, and then the loans, all of that was a delicate equation. Uh, and so when we did the price application in whatever year I was still there, uh, it solved the equation. The day, and we made this very public, including to this committee, the day that the outcome was different, we made it clear that Eskom's financial viability is significantly under threat. We made that publicly clear. It's in our statements of financial report. But we Sorry, had a Mr. Bra Mr. Damas, your time with Mr. Swart is up.